Welcome everybody to the Existentialist Society in Melbourne, Australia. I'm David Miller. I'm the secretary of the Existentialist Society. Existentialism is an umbrella term covering diverse and often conflicting schools of thought. Consequently, we're not agreed on who or what is an existentialist. We simply agree to disagree. So the views of our speaker are um, his own. Um, and our speaker today is Bernie Lewin, who's the academic director of the Platonic Academy of Melbourne. And Bernie's topic is lullabies for the dying from platonic myths to Christian beliefs. Bernie. Oh, you're muted, Bernie. Thank you very much, David, for that introduction. And uh, yeah, welcome everyone. I'm, um, I'm Bernie Lewin from the Platonic Academy of Melbourne. So the Platonic Academy of Melbourne is a bunch of Plato nuts who run courses mostly reading Plato's famous dialogues like the Republic and so forth. Um, if you wanna catch uh, our courses, just uh, find us at Platonic Academy of Melbourne. You should be able to find that in Google fairly easily. Um, so we have courses running through most of the year and um, you might find something of interest to you there. So thank you, David, and the Existential Society for having me along um, to give you a bit of a taste of Plato with a bit of an angle for, um, I think it was um, um, agnostics, I thought. Maybe there's a few agnostics here, giving a bit of an angle and, and looking at um, Christian belief and the origins of Christian belief a little bit related to Plato. So we're going to be considering Plato the myth maker to start with, how Plato seems to have not only retold old myths, but invented new ones. To what purpose? Myths? Plato will tell us. Are there good and bad myths? Certainly there are. But most of the old Greek myths about gods and heroes, they're no good and they have to be gotten rid of according to Plato. Plato tells us how these can be replaced with new invented myths that will foster social reform, moderate basic base desires to promote a healthy mind and healthy society, the social control, a better way, a kinder way than threats of violence. Myths that can control society better than violence and fear. Plato invented this idea or promoted this idea in the fourth century BC. And then much later, much, much later, very similar myths appeared in Christianity to much the same purpose. It's strange, eh? How does this happen? Well, we're going to look into this a little today. So today I thought I'd introduce the myth mythological transmission with a bit of a raid for the first hour or so, and then open it to discussion. I can tell you a bit more and show you a few maps and timelines after that, if you like. I'm, go I'm going to start though with one of these myths that Plato seems to have invented. So it's story time now, folks. So you can put your Zoom on to speak of you and sit back and enjoy the myth. Then I'll discuss it, contextualize it a bit, relate it to the Christian myths and the, uh, the um, emergence of Christianity, and then we can have a bit of a chat. So how does that sound? Okay, all right, let's go. So, you might have heard of Socrates. He lived in Athens more than four centuries before Jesus, 400 years before Christ. Socrates was a skeptical philosopher in the habit of striking up conversations 
in the habit of striking up conversations with puffed up members of the learned elite only to deflate their bubble. This habit didn't tend to win the right, the right sort of friends for Socrates, but he did have a posse of youthful admirers. You might have also heard that it didn't end well for Socrates. Late in life, he was accused of disrespecting the traditional gods and of corrupting the youth of Athens. Convicted and found guilty by a large jury, he was sentenced to death by drinking the hemlock. Socrates never wrote anything down. That was not his style. But one of his students, Plato, immortalized him, his memory in dialogues, in these very wordy plays where a fictionalized Socrates would take the leading role. One of these dialogues depicts Socrates' last day in prison, chatting away to his circle of acolytes, cheerily philosophizing right up to the final climactic scene. As the sun is setting, he takes the hemlock. The numbness moves slowly up his body. He says his last words and dies. Was that the end of Socrates? Or is he immortal? Not in body, of course, but in soul. This is the overriding theme of this Plato's dialogue called the Phaedo. Is the soul immortal? Is there an afterlife for the individual soul? Various arguments are prevent, presented in an attempt to prove that death is not the end. Some of these arguments are rather far-fetched. Others appear contradictory. The final argument for the soul's immortality is that it is immortal in the same way that the number three is immortal. One particular instance of three, three things, might disappear. Like when a three becomes a four, like my daughter in her third year and then she becomes four. In this case, the three qua third goes away, but it still exists somewhere. And more importantly, the number three always exists in itself. This is the thing with Plato. It still exists in a formal sense. Numbers themselves, not numbered things, numbers themselves always exist outside time, beyond sense and particularity an important lesson in Plato's theory of forms. But here in this argument, it's important too. Just as with the number three, so with the soul. In the same way that three is immortal, so is the soul. We won't go into the argument right now, but that is how it goes. The soul immortal, like three or two or one. They're always there somewhere, expressed in some ways, and they are in themselves immortal. Of course, this is a very abstract notion of life after death. That our afterlife might continue like a mathematical entity. It's not reassuring for the ego self facing departure from friends and family, from social life, social being, the very end of consciousness, of experience, death as we know it. But then we get this myth. Just before Socrates takes the poison chalice, he tells a story of the afterlife. Now you can find this in the Phaedo if you want to go and look at it later from page 1 
07C. The story begins with a preamble. If death meant being separated from everything, Socrates says, it would be a godsend for bad folks to die and be separated at once from the body and from all their badness, along with their soul. But as things are, given that the soul is evidently immortal, like the number three, there'd be no way for our soul to escape from evil, no way of saving itself, except by becoming as good and wise as possible. This is how the story goes, says Socrates, which in Plato indicates the beginning of a myth. It's like once upon a time. This is how the story goes. What they say is that in fact, each person's own guardian spirit, the one to whom he has been allotted in life, we might translate this guardian angel, tries to bring him after his death to a certain place where the assembled company must submit themselves for trial before journeying to the other world. Continuing a bit further down, now when the dead come to the place to which each is taken by their guardian spirit guide, they first must submit to a process of judgment, both those who have led fine and pious lives and those who have not. Those judged to have lived a middling kind of life journey to the river Acheron, where they board boats and journey to the lake. There they reside and undergo purification. We might say purgatory. This purification, according to each as he deserves, paying penalties to absolve him from any crimes committed and receiving honors for any benefits bestowed. As for those judged incurable, because of the enormity of their errors, whether they have repeatedly stolen large sums from the temples or killed lots of people contrary to justice and law, they have committed or they have committed other such heinous crimes. The fate of these fittingly is to be cast into the infernal abyss of Tartarus, never to emerge again. Now, not all those thrown into this hell are never to emerge again. The story continues explaining that there is another category of souls fated to be thrown into Tartarus, consisting of those judged to have committed error that is curable, but serious nonetheless. For example, people who have committed an act of violence towards a father or a mother, but live to regret it for the rest of their lives. When these lesser sinners have been in Tartarus for one year, it surges, disgorge them into a river. And as they are carried along beside the Lake Acheron, they scream and call out to their victims, begging forgiveness, begging permission to transit from the river to the tranquil lake. Those who are forgiven are released from their suffering. But those not forgiven are carried off again into Tartarus and from there back again into the river and again back into hell. And so it goes around and around year after year until they are forgiven. Because that is the penalty imposed upon those by the judges. But what of good folk? What happens to them? Socrates explains. 
those judged to have done exceptionally well towards living piously are free from the, these regions and released as if from prisons, moving to that pure place of residence. Further down it continues, and for, um, from among those in this pure place of residence, those who have purified themselves sufficiently well by means of philosophy, their souls dwell entirely within bodies, without bodies. Their souls dwell entirely without bodies for the time ever after and come to reside in the most beautiful places. It is for the sake of the things we have described, Simeus. Socrates is talking to his acolyte, young Simeus. It is for the sake of the things we have described, Simeus, that we must do everything to ensure one share of goodness and wisdom in this life. Fine is the prize and the hope is great. So that ends the story, that ends the myth. At which point Socrates says, of course, no reasonable person ought to insist that the facts are exactly as I have described, but that something like this is true about our souls and the place in which they dwell, the places in which they dwell. Given that the soul is clearly something immortal, we've proved that, this story does seem to me to be worth insisting upon and worth risking. For someone who thinks it to be so, the risk, after all, is a fine one. We should use such charms as this story to enchant ourselves, which is why I drew this story out for so long. We should use such charms to enchant ourselves, which is why I drew this story out for so long, says Socrates. And while Socrates is enchanting himself with this story of the afterlife, the sun is getting lower. When he finishes, the sun is setting. It's nearly time for Socrates to take the hemlock. The drama of the Phaedo is reaching its peak when Socrates makes his final speech to his teary acolytes. There are reasons why a man should have confidence about his soul. Not every man, Socrates explains, only those who in their lives have waved goodbye to those other pleasures, not philosophy and adornments, namely those of the body, treating these as alien to him and doing much more harm than good, who has instead occupied himself with the pleasures of learning and adorned his soul, not with alien adornments, but those that belong to the soul, moderation, justice, courage, freedom and truth. He waits thus prepared for the journey to the next world, whatever fate, whenever fate should summons him. Socrates goes on. So you, Simi, Simeus and Sebius, and all you others will all make your separate journeys there at some future time when fate summons you. But for now, it is I whom fate has called. As a tragic character might say. And so it is about time I head for the bath because it would be better to drink the poison freshly bathed and not give the women the trouble 
of washing a corpse. What are we to make of this? This is a story of the soul's journey into the afterlife that includes a guardian angel, a moral judgment of one's life, then reward or retribution, heaven and hell. Does it sound familiar? This story seems to draw partly from popular Greek myth, but also perhaps from the myths of the secretive Greek mystery cults. You can ask me about them later. In a way that brings it close to Christian myth of the soul and afterlife. Christian mythology that has survived into our time. What's curious is that there is very little of this in the Bible. The New Testament talks of spirit as opposed to physical animal body. And it talks of possession by the Holy Spirit and the divine logos, the medium of God within. Many times it explains that this God within is the kingdom reign of God, our taste of eternity in this life. The Bible does not use the language, platonic language of the soul, the suki in the Greek, nor does it say much about what happens immediately after one dies. Instead, the Bible does tell a story of the end of times, of a bodily resurrection, which is an entirely different thing. This bodily resurrection is John's apocalypse, revelations. In the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelations, there is also a judgment, but this is on a judgment day. That is at the end of the world as we know it, the end of history. On that particular day, which is not so far away, the end is nigh. On that great day, at the end of times, the dead will be physically raised from their graves so that the good folk, both the quick and the dead, may come to life in a new Jerusalem. Descended from heaven, you see the old Jerusalem had just been destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, just before this was written. We'll come to that. According to the last book of the Bible, This shining new Jerusalem will descend from heaven for Christ's reign on earth. This is the canonical second coming story, the original official Christian story in the Bible. As we so often find in Christianity, so here the teaching on salvation There's two competing overlapping narratives. In this case, the overlap is where both stories have a moral judgment followed by reward and retribution. What's different is that Plato's story of this, is that Plato's story of the soul, the individual soul and its afterlife in spirit separate from the body, a resurrection in spirit, if you like. Down through the history of Christianity, the Bible story of the end of times would compete with and blend with stories of what individual souls would experience after they separate from their body directly after their own individual death. That such stories of the soul's afterlife, after separating from the Bible, 
are nowhere explicit in the Bible should be no surprise to anyone who's read the old Jewish books at the beginning of the Bible. There we find a strong and explicitly policed separation of us mere mortals from the immortal, fearful, divine authority. Some folks here might know of the myth of the Garden of Eden, that there was this tree of knowledge from which Adam and Eve did eat, and they lost their innocence. They became self-conscious, capable of sin. But there was another special tree in that primeval paradise, the tree of life with fruits of immortality. After man woman's first transgression, Yahweh set up guards to prevent them eating also from this tree. Heaven forbid that they might become like gods. The Tower of Babel, do you know that story, is another story from old Judaism where aspirations to divinity are thwarted by God. Not so our Platonic myths, where aspirations to the life of the divine are encouraged in deeds one's life. This life should be a preparation for such divinity in the life ever after. After The likes of this story we have just read, this story of the soul and its afterlife, are a direct challenge to the lessons of old Judaism. They say that us mere mortals are immortal, not in body, but in the invisible soul which is immortal if it is good and separates itself successfully from the mortal body through mortification. In this life, it can aspire to a life of the divine. Because between Plato in the fourth century BC and the very beginnings, the very obscure beginnings of Christianity, as a Jewish sect, three centuries and more of Hellenic cultural diffusion. After the conquest of Alexander the Great, around 330 years before Christ, there was this great diffusion of Greek culture, of Greek philosophy. It would mix and blend with other traditions, Egyptian, Babylonian, and Jewish, but all in the Greek language. Judaism was Hellenized to a remarkable extent in the three centuries before Christianity emerged, before Christianity emerged as a Hellenistic religion of Jewish origin. Christianity is so much more than the followers of Jesus. The parables and moral teachings of Jesus are insufficient to the needs of a complete religious doctrine. Consider for one, there's no coherent theory of God. If you know your gospels, if you know the sayings of Jesus, there's no coherent theory of God, of the one worshipful creator God himself, surely an essential part of the Christian religion. That had to develop. It took time, it took centuries, and in fact it developed into the three-in-one trinity. But that came later, much later, centuries later, through direct influence from Greek philosophy as also did the platonic soul in its afterlife and the possibility of eternal divinity diffused through the Hellenistic world and on into Christianity. At their source, at least, at their first recorded source in Plato, the story we just heard from the Phaedo, the story of Socrates' last day, is not the only place 
where we find such stories in Plato's dialogues. There are other similar, but not entirely consistent, stories of the soul's reward and retribution in the afterlife. At the end of Plato's Republic, the book where Plato outlines his ideal society, the first utopia in our tradition, right at the end of that book, book 10 of the Republic, we come to the myth of Ur. Ur was a soldier who had been given up for dead on the battlefield, but came back to life. One of these near-death experiences, he was sent back to life according to the myth, to tell folks of what happens after, to warn of his experience of the soul's afterlife, of judgment, of punishment and reward. And in another dialogue, the Phaedrus, there's this wonderful story of souls as winged horse chariots, flying to eternal divinity, in the high heavens. This highlights one of the big differences with Greek myth. Hades was below, underground, while the divine resided above in the heavens. In the old Greek stories, you go down to Hades. In Plato, you go up, up to heaven. In the old Greek myths, as with old Judaism, there are all these cautionary tales of mortals' aspirations to divinity, to godliness. Not here. This is a break with Plato. Human souls can, if they are good, aspire to divinity, to a life in the highest heavens. So, the early fathers of the church, the patriarchs, as they're called, those that fleshed out the parables and sayings of Jesus into a fully fleshed religion, the fathers of the church invited Platonism. We can see this in their writings. We know this from their biography. They were fully immersed in it. Some were schooled in Plato, even as Christians. The schools were still open well into the fifth century and even into the sixth. Some were Platonists before they were Christian. And they saw no contradiction between Platonist doctrine and Christian doctrine. So some of them were converts from Platonism, like St. Augustine in the fourth century, right? Long after Jesus. At and he saw no contradiction, as did so many fathers before him. Origen, Clement of Alexandria, and right back to Justin of Martyr, Justin Martyr. Not much more than a hundred years after Jesus' crucifixion. These fathers took the Platonic doctrine of the soul with them. And these myths. These stories of the afterlife that appeared in Plato's dialogues explicitly um, de demarked in Plato as myths to enchant our souls. These were brought into Christianity. These stories of the afterlife are, are, are reflected in the early church writings on the immortality of the soul. And not just the afterlife, the Platonic myths tell of many lives, reincarnation until finally arriving at eternal repose with the divines, with the divine, much like Buddhism. In fact, in the early church fathers, we do get pre-existence, not just post-existence, pre-existence of souls even reincarnation. Reincarnation in Christianity, oh yes, but this Platonizing was soon extinguished as too much of a departure from the Bible and from old Judaism. The pre-life of the soul was extinguished as heresy 
but not the promise of the soul's afterlife. Stories of the afterlife of the soul would live on and thrive without biblical authority. Indeed, almost without dogmatic authority. Take a look at church do uh, doctrinal texts like catechisms, where you find there's not much detail about exactly what goes on in the soul's afterlife. That the soul's reward and punishment, purgatory, heaven and hell, are generally only vaguely referenced and generally later, might surprise those here brought up in Christianity, as it did me. What did you, what was your Sunday school vision? Perhaps you were hammered with the end of the day's apocalypse, the story at the end of the Bible. Check it out, read it, read the last book of the Bible and see if it matches the stories you were told. Not likely, not likely these days, more likely in modern times in middle-class, respectable, sober Christianity, these end of the world apocalyptic dramas are rather well, Dark Ages, those medieval paintings. Instead, I suspect that most of us heard, if we were good, after I die, my soul will perhaps spend some time in purgatory or otherwise go straight to heaven to live with God in happiness forever and ever after. But this is not in the original essential biblical texts. The original and core teaching is the one in Revelation that the dead will rise on the last day to live in the new Jerusalem. No body and soul separation there. The extra biblical story of the soul and its, after, its journey in the afterlife survived and evolved as myths and retelling through pre preaching, through Sunday school fables, through fiction and fantastic art. Outside the catechism, outside the Bible, they survived, indeed thrived, so that in our lifetime, they have surpassed the biblical revelation of the last days to prevail in the Christian talks, tales told to children in our times. Perhaps they were told to you. By the way, extraordinary though it seems, this is not the only mythology that flourished through Christianity in this extra canonical way. The transmission of these stories of the soul's salvation should be compared with the stories of Mary, the Madonna, the Godmother Mary, Theotokos. Notre Dame, Our Lady, the cult of Mary the Immaculate, pure unmarked. This has a similar and even more powerful extra conical tradition. Go try to find it in the Bible, you can't. Okay, so let's now return to the Phaedo that we were reading. The, re the, the myth we were reading in the Phaedo. And notice how Socrates introduces this story by saying, this is how the story goes. It's a signal that he's telling a story like once upon a time. And then he says at the end, of course, no reasonable person ought to insist on the facts exactly as I describe. Why then is Socrates telling this story? Elsewhere, we find the character of Socrates is going on and on about wanting to find the truth. In this dialogue in the Phaedo, he has just proved that the soul is immortal, but only in a very formal way, just like the number three, the soul is immortal. Not much cons consolation there for the ego self. But as for this story, this myth of the soul's journey in the afterlife, this invented myth does give great comfort to the ego soul of the good and worthy listener. <laughs>
Socrates closes his storytelling by saying, well, something like this is probably true. And it is worth, worth risking believing in this. And we should use such charms to enchant ourselves. What is he saying? What is Plato doing here? Is Plato through Socrates suggesting that the story that I just read out should serve as a lullaby for the dying? A lullaby that Socrates tells himself and his friends to allay their anxiety. This and much more are suggested a few pages back in the dialogue. On page 91, B, if you want to find it. If you go and have a look, we find Socrates' so the Socratic method of dialectic inquiry coming into question. Socrates talks about the distorting influences on investigations, like those with a vested interest in a particular outcome of a dialogue tend to lead it astray. It's no longer our scientific inquiry into truth, but more like persuasion, more like public speaking, not seeking the truth, but arriving at a particular conclusion like you've been set, a debating topic, like the rhetoric taught by the sophists, who the fictional Socrates often berates as in not interested in finding truth. The aim is persuasion, not truth. But here Socrates says, well, I feel at my present moment that I'm nearly as bad as they are. What present moment? He's about to die. Right at that dramatic time, within hours of his death, Socrates has a rather strong investment in the outcome of this debate about the immortality of the soul. Assent to the perhaps true belief that the soul is not immortal, that this now, this swallowing the hemlock, is the end, the absolute final end of myself. Assent to perhaps the true belief would not, would not. Uh, would perhaps dull his cheery demeanor. But Socrates then says that he has weighed his position carefully. If his theory about the immortality of the soul is not true, well, if it is true, then of course, it is best to believe it. But what if it's false? Then it is also best to believe it. If death really is the final end, then by believing that it's not the final end, he is at least likely, he is less likely to be distressed and to distress his fellows in mourning. If it is really the final end, then his false opinion will die with him. He won't know the better. We get this. In the dialogue, just before Socrates tells the story I have read out. Here Socrates is talking not about the fantastic story, though, but about the arguments he's just made to prove that the soul's immortal. Socrates is saying that we will never really know the truth while we're alive, but by persuading oneself to the perhaps false belief in the soul's immortality does little harm and much good, especially as death approaches. We should enchant ourselves with such stories because for one, it calms the dying and the mourners, and also because it encourages folks to be good, to do good and not to do bad things. Such stories are good for the individual and good for society. Socrates says it's worth risking, the risk after all is a good one. So now let's compare this with Christianity. With Christianity's treatment of such stories of the soul's journey into the afterlife, passed down or orally, not in the canonical writings. To some extent, 
This is how such stories have been treated in the Christian churches. As Socrates said, when Plato invented these myths, as the fictional Socrates said in Plato's play. After they entered Christianity, these stories remained in that middling ground, not in the canon, not even in the dogma, in the catechism, but more, but not heretical either. They were considered a useful addition as supporting and reassuring. Support and reassurance for the revealed canon, the apocrypha, as they're called. In this view, all these stories of the afterlife of reward and punishment, the fire and brimstone preaching to the masses, the stories that fill Christian children with fear, they will be tolerated and encouraged, not because they're true, but because they make for a good citizen, for a good Christian society. Anyway, let me take you back to Plato. To understand what Plato is doing with mythology, we need to understand Plato's two different modes, mythos and logos. For Plato, scientific discourse, logos, is all about making arguments that can be found to be true or false, either by reference to experience, that's empirical science, or otherwise by reference to the formal nature of things, the formal sciences, mathematics and geome uh, geometry and arithmetic. These days, we would say that physicists and mathematicians make and defend falsifiable hypotheses where a proposal is demonstrated to be true on the evidence that could be false on other evidence that could always be found to be false if the right evidence were found. But what about discourses that can't be falsified, like stories of the ancient past or stories of the afterlife? Can they be falsified? On what evidence? We have no way of knowing. They are unfalsifiable in this sense. And that is where we come to good old fashioned storytelling, like the traditional stories that all Greeks heard from childhood. These stories are told in the great poems of Homer and Hesiod. And they were the basis of traditional cultural education in ancient Greece. But these stories tell of jealous and angry gods acting on base emotions towards mortals and immortals alike. In Plato's Republic, in his ideal society, these stories would be rejected. Plato rejects these stories of gods and heroes as the basis of the cultural education, not so much because they ain't true, but more because these stories don't promote good psychosocial health, harmony of the mind, harmony of society, harmony of the mind and society together. They don't promote it because they excite bodily emotions. They persuade by emotions, not by a reason. And they, they, um, this imagination distracts folks from attention in the other direction towards where Plato wants you to look, towards the forms and the form of forms, the one good God. Instead, Plato proposes for his Republic, the development of new mythology. Such stories would serve the purpose of promoting good behavior and social cohesion. At one point, he calls them noble lies. Noble lies. According to Plato, such noble lives are better for controlling society, for keeping the peace and harmony than violence and the threat, threat of violence. So there will be poetry. There will be stories and myths in the Republic. 
only they will be controlled by the state. Poets will be commissioned to write stories that model and promote virtue, a kind of propaganda. Now, of course, this approach to stories has its dangers, some of which we know from the 20th century. It, it comes right out, in coming right out and explicitly suggesting that the purpose of these stories is sometime, something other than to speak the truth. This is, well, disrespectful to the gods. And it's skeptical. Remember the historical Socrates was the model of a skeptic and he was killed for disrespecting the gods. And we should also note that some of Socrates' youthful followers were later accused of disrespecting of such disrespect, including El Kebides, who is introduced, who appears in Plato's Symposium, and including Critias, who wrote a satirical play, which is our earliest surviving source of atheism, the first appearance in our tradition. This satirical play written by a student of Socrates tells of purposeful invention of gods, of fear of gods promoted for the purposes of social control. To consider a myth in terms of its psycho, psychological and social impact and not for its truth value. We might call this the sociological approach to knowledge and this sociological self-conscious approach to cultural traditional education continued in the Hellenistic period among the Epicureans, among the skeptics. Religious stories were explicitly recognized to have a sociological purpose and they were sometimes lampooned to this effect as controlling the population through fear. This sociological approach to knowledge persisted in Roman literature. A marvelous example is Livy's History of Rome, where Livy describes how er the early Roman emperor Numa purposefully introduced religion to keep the peace of the new empire. In the Re Renaissance, Machiavelli famously picked up on this in his discourse on Livy. And this is how we find religious skepticism revived in a sociological discourse where knowledge was considered not in terms of its truth value, but in terms of its psychosocial effect, whether for comfort or for fear. For fear, build a good society on fear of retribution in the afterlife. For comfort, we enchant ourselves, our ego selves, with stories of immortality to allay fear in the dying and sorrow in the mourners. Of course, this approach, Plato's approach, even where it is sympathetic and supportive of myths, risks promoting skepticism, cynicism, atheism. This was not exactly Plato's purpose, but it was his purpose to some extent. He had to say that he wanted to get rid of the old gods and through his influence on Hellenistic philosophy and religion, including Christianity, he succeeded. The way he did this was ingenious. He had two ways, right? The way of science, logos, as he called it, true by reference to experience, empirical science, mathematical science, the formal sciences, and then he had myth. Mythos, not logos. Mythos was not true by reference to experience or to the forms, rather it was true by a moral reference. How does this work? Strategically, it was ingenious. Plato said that God and the gods are good. They must be good. 
No one can deny that. To say the gods are good is surely respecting the gods. And so all those stories that present them as bad must be false. All Homer stories, Hesiod stories, they must be false if they present the gods in a bad light. It is on this basis that most of the old stories of Homer and Hesiod would be banned from Plato's Republic and replaced by true myths. That is true by reference to gods as good. And so this is how we get myth true and false by reference. First, by, by moral reference, first by determining what is morally good, a big question in the uh, Platonic dialogues, and then developing myth true to that standard. In this way, Plato justified the creation of a whole new mythology that modeled good behavior for the young and for society in general. The new mythology would be designed to the purpose of promoting virtuous behavior, and so social cohesion, and so good psychosocial health. Not only would this mythology model virtuous behavior, but it would also include invented stories that instilled belief that fostered good behavior, such as stories of the afterlife that involve reward for good, and retribution for bad in the afterlife. Soldiers, says Socrates, will be brave in the face of death. And otherwise, when someone who has led a good life is dying, then they and their loved ones will be comforted by knowing that they are going to a better place. We enchant ourselves with lullabies for the dying. And we model good behavior for the good of the soul and the good of the state. And so it seems this is exactly how such myths were taken up by Christianity. Okay, <laughs> that's enough from me. Let's hear from you guys. Well, thank you, Bernie Lewin, for your presentation to the Existential Society on Lullabies for the Dying from Platonic Myths to Christian Beliefs.